Yeah. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm trying to think we should maybe make this like, a little more intimate because there's like not a huge group of us, but you guys want to scoot in a little closer, maybe? Uh, yeah, we ordered a bunch of food, so we got a shit ton of nothing coming at like 7.30. So uh, <laughs> we basically managed for about like 10 dumplings per person for 35. But now that there's like 15, 20, it's like 20 dumplings per person now. So we'll have to take home if you want. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Al. Uh, I'm the one that's been spamming all of you guys about coming to the meetup. And uh, my colleague Evan is downstairs doing the door. He's going to come up in a few minutes. And yeah, this is actually our first like meetup ever in the East Coast. Pretty excited. Uh, just to give you some background, I actually am the only New York City um, employee of Coda. Everyone else is in the Bay Area. And luckily enough, Evan was able to come from SF to help me out a little bit. Uh, but yeah, this is pretty, it's going to be pretty casual. I uh, have a few speakers coming to talk to you guys about how they're building their, their docs. And uh, yeah, just quick show of hands, like who here is using Coda so far? Okay, who hasn't used it? Okay, cool. Wow, it's actually a lot more that though. Yeah, Evan, when he comes in, he's going to kind of like uh, talk through like what Coda is, the background, some of the new features, um, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, uh, not to find some time to find a way to fill the time while he comes up. Um, what have you used Coda for so far? Uh, Steven? Yeah, Steven. Um, whoa, 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 whoa. You mean like specific, like what does each document do or? Uh, like overall, like what kind of oh, things do you do? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, oh, so new, new company, new startup, uh, it, First, I, I pulled that up because it's solving a particular problem that I've never been able to solve. It's going to be building a startup, which is how do I get my, I built this tool at the very start of a new company called Language System, which is an evolving document of definitions of terms. So everyone, it's, when they say X, they mean X. Uh, and I needed a place for people to go because I keep putting it in Google Docs and people wouldn't refer to it and they would forget it. It wasn't being maintained. And yet it's so important at the beginning starting something that everyone has a vocabulary mm -hmm. uh, and that they can uh, refer to it. So, And then, the power of it was I built this table with my language system like I did with the box. And then every time I created a new product definition document in Coda, I could reference okay. terms. And so it forced, it forced all the individuals to basically practice the use of those terms in my vocabulary system uh, okay. as we start building new documents in Coda. Gotcha. That's the can sound the most powerful thing. Okay, so you, your case was like you were launching several startups. Yeah, we launched startups, startups all the time. And so okay. I, like, every time you start a new startup, you've got a new domain, you've got new terms, and you pull the team together. You're like, so mm -hmm. when you say, when you say, you know, uh, risk area, what, what does that mean again? Yeah. So I, I do that every time, but I always bring a Google Docs and people forget to go look at it. Right. But more importantly, because it's in a table, Every time we create a new document code, you can reference any of the terms. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Yeah, so single source of truth. Yeah. With all your right. sort of terms. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. For that particular company. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so this is. <laughs> oh, this is Evan. Yeah. I was trying to kill his time. So I was asking people what they're. Um, so Evan and I were on the same team at Coda. Uh, I think I'm kind of walking through on the mic now. On the growth team, and uh, I've been following all of SF to give a rundown of what Coda is, what it's about, and ask what it's for. So I dropped 30 degrees coming up here. Yeah, <laughs> <You're right. laughs> this is pretty rough. <laughs> it snowed this morning. Oh, it snowed. I grew up here, so I'm totally. I'm just now a winter <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you want? Uh, oh, I have to. Well, talk to them. Yeah. Great. Cool. How's it? Uh, percentage of Coda users versus not Coda users. People who know. Yeah. Oh, you've already done it. <laughs> <laughs> like, is there, are there two mics? Yeah, we calculated the percentage. So. Oh, we have done it. Yeah, yeah. Great. Cool. Cool. Um, so I guess I'll just stand over here. Over here. Um, so I'm just going to give a quick, just a quick download of what Coda is for folks who aren't familiar with it, um, and then for many of you who are, we'll 
probably understand a lot of the stuff already. Uh, but then we're going to get to the meat of this, which is some of our makers who have been uh, gracious enough to spend their time and, uh, and to present on their docs and what they've done. Uh, this is us. Um, so when we started Coda, uh, we started with this thesis. So we started the product about four years ago, um, building itself for the first three to build out the infrastructure. And if you actually go to our blog, you'll see one of the first posts we ever uh, wrote and posted up there was this, was this long form thesis that actually was like splayed on the walls of the office from probably the first couple of weeks. Um, we have a plotter in our office uh, inexplicably, and that's the main thing that we printed on it. <laughs> Watch out for that. Um, uh, but one of the things, uh, we start with an observation, our founding team who came from uh, YouTube and Microsoft and a bunch of other uh, companies um, was why in a world where we have a bunch of best read applications that are being launched every single day, why do people still resort to docs and spreadsheets to do most of their important work? Um, I think the answer is pretty obvious to most people who think about it. It's they're insanely flexible. Everyone kind of understands them. They've been around for a really long time. Um, but realistically, it's also a way to apply a personal experience to, to the work that you're doing that you can't do with an enterprise application. Uh, made it, like the, the, the power of an enterprise uh, application is that they apply some sort of perspective to you, and that's how you use it. Uh, but the, the challenge with that is that you can't actually customize it in the infinite ways that you actually think and work every single day. Um, and what we've also observed is that all these really compelling and interesting usages of docs and spreadsheets um, that are actually, actually feel a lot like applications at the end of the day. They're these custom processes, you're exporting the CSV, and then you're building these little tools. And so we thought, well, there's definitely a group of makers out there who are doing this, who want to feel empowered to build the tools. They may not have CS degrees, they may not be developers, but they want to take these same primitives and build the things that are actually working for them versus things that have been applied to them. Uh, so we thought, why not build, if we could rip it down into studs, how would we build the Docker of the future uh, from the ground up so that we could actually empower these folks to use the same primitives they're used to and they understand, but to build these really compelling and app-like experiences without having to get a CS degree, without having to go and, and become a developer to do that. Um, and so over the, last, the first few years that we were building this product, we started with a bunch of basic primitives that we knew needed to be there, um, and we built this all right from the ground up. So uh, if you look at early screenshots of our product, we'll actually be sending out a release note uh, later this month that shows some of the earliest screenshots. It's literally just a table, uh, and then it starts expanding, and there's a little canvas that shows up. Uh, we started with the basics of the test, text editor, making sure that that felt uh, very parallel to what we expect from Google Docs, um, all the sharing and everything like that. Uh, then we focused a lot of energy on the tables. Uh, the idea that structured data is really how people power a lot of the work that they do, and spreadsheets are super not effective for the way that most people use them. Uh, we're not using them as ledgers, we're using them as task lists, we're using them as a contact list, we might use them on our camping trip with our friends. Uh, so how do we make sure that the table structure actually supports the use cases that most people are trying to use these tools for? Uh, so we built out uh, rich column formatting, we built these tables to feel like databases so they're a little bit more structured. Um, and we made them filterable, groupable. We gave people at people's fingertips the things like pivot tables, which are super convoluted in Excel and, and sheets. Uh, just the click of a button, you can kind of group things and super set things together. Um, and then from there, we kind of went and said, okay, we're going to pull all these things together. We built a rich formula language. So we went and started building something that felt like a combination of SQL and Excel formulas so that people could actually use names to describe the things that are in their docs and be able to reference them and really. Uh, easy to understand ways versus ways that are like A1, B2, battleship references and so on. Um, and then lastly, when we think about the apps that we all use every single day, they're mostly about the interaction patterns. They're not about like going to a spreadsheet and like typing in numbers. They're about like, how do I do a drop down list? How do I check a box? Those are things that we're used to in mobile, on web. Um, so we introduced all these controls, which are different mechanisms where you can apply a user experience on top of something that's a source of data or, or a canvas for um, so that was where we started and where we spent most of the first few years. Um, and after we went out of, uh, we launched out of self in October of last year. Um, even before that, we had a bunch of customers using the product, but since then we've seen a lot of interest and a lot of people jumping on board. Uh, folks like Uber building uh, a tracker for all of their product launches for their latest app redesign uh, for their driver side app. Um, so using it to track how close to complete they are. Um, the folks at Spotify here in, this, in the city are actually using us to track a lot of their OKRs and, and how they actually translate features towards milestones. Um, Betterment, also here in the city, is using us to track product uh, marketing launches. So how do we take each individual launch and figure out what the right mix of channels are, and then we 
and can then communicate effectively. Um, to small companies as well, like Intent HQ in London, uh, who use us for basically a lightweight CRM. They build their strategic account plans in the product. If you imagine people who are in Salesforce every day, you have all the rich source of truth, but you don't have a way of typing out your like bolded list of like, this is what I'm gonna do this week to work with this account, and here's where we are with it. And so they're able to build this kind of rich experience that combines the structured data that you might get from Salesforce with the Canvas. Um, and lastly, these folks at Monday, who are actually based in New York now, but were in Spain before, using us to track user feedback in their product launches. So all of these are different tools that were built with these base primitives that we released um, when we went live in the world last year. Um, and they're all featured in this gallery experience. We hope that everybody here eventually is in the top rail of, of makers. You'll actually see uh, later that many of the folks in the room today are actually represented uh, with their actual likeness on this top rail. We really think that we're empowering this group of folks who really want uh, to come out and build these, these rich app-like experiences and share them with the world, and we're featuring them in our, in our gallery to, to help you share that look. Um, so with that, just a couple of quick uh, new building blocks that we launched. So for folks who are users of our product, have seen us announce these over the last three months. Uh, we actually had a small user event in uh, San Francisco where we launched these, or pre-launched these features, I should say. We've, we've talked about them, but we didn't have them ready just yet. Now they're actually in the product. Um, so one thing that was obviously missing from our original primitives was a way to interact or uh, bring existing data from other systems into Coda and allow you to push outside. And we thought, if you're going to rebuild that from the ground up, what are some of the ways that people actually interact with existing tools? One of them is they literally copy and paste links to other tools into a spreadsheet. And so what if when you drop a link in, it actually allows you to authenticate with that tool and brings back all the data associated with that JIRA ticket, that GitHub pull request, or uh, even uh, the stuff you might be transactions in Stripe maybe in the future. Um, and then what if you could also use the data inside of Coda to push out updates to another uh, solution, like Slack as an update, uh, as something is ready to merge and you want to send an update to your team without having to go and copy and paste a bunch of that stuff out. Um, so PAX is a really interesting way of bringing in existing data from other tools, but also pushing data between tools as kind of a, a hub of information. Um, recently, we also released automation, which is a way to actually do some of those activities that you might do every day, some of the mundane tasks like updating status and sending a status email every week, uh, making those much more automated in the product. Uh, so you can actually, uh, when you apply a trigger or an action, uh, you can say on Friday of every week, I want to send this formatted section of my document out with, a, with the status update that I'm usually going and copy and pasting little, little pieces of different parts of data sets that I'm working with into this, this form email. Um, so trying to get a lot of the low value work out of the hands of users and, and put that into the, the hands of Coda. Um, and then the last piece is layouts. So another compelling part about existing tools is, is that they can actually be framed in different ways based on the interaction you want. So if you, if you were to rebuild Yelp, you wouldn't want to look at it like an Excel spreadsheet. You want to actually have the picture of the food that you're looking at and be able to scroll through it. You want to have buttons to go and like things. Um, and so we, I uh, spent a lot of time and energy taking the idea of a row and a table and then allowing you to frame it in the way that you want to make sure that you have the experience that your users of the stock uh, can have. Um, so those are the three main things that we launched. Um, we're still working on a lot of different uh, parts of the app experience before we launch out of beta early next year. Um, a hint towards mobile is one of the biggest things that we're spending time on right now and one of the biggest requests from existing users. Uh, we know and it's coming. <laughs> um, but yeah, any questions on that? Just basic ones. We can obviously talk a bunch after uh, we have some of the folks talk. But anything at all? Cool. Did all I right. hold the mic? Oh, <laughs> Screaming. All right, thanks, Evan. So we're going to first have Caroline from the New York Times. <laughs> Not New York Times, the New York Times. I can travel about, to Lena. Yeah, we'll talk about her job. Yeah. Use case. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Caroline. Um, I work in technology teams at the New York Times. So um, I work with our teams that work on digital storytelling, all of the experiences that someone might have when they look at an article or interact with um, like an interactive map or something like that. 
Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit today about uh, building a Coda doc that centralized all of our road mapping and project prioritization, and a little bit about how that changed the way that we work, because it really did. Um, so as a project manager, I spend a lot of time thinking about how to like, organize information, align different groups of people, um, synthesize different uh, pieces of work that's going on for lots of different types of audiences. Um, and sort of to what Evan said, I spend a lot of time doing like low value work, sending out status updates, collecting information from lots of different groups of people. Um, and so we built, uh, we built a code of document to get all of our team's roadmaps in sync and to automate all of those processes that I was sort of taking on um, and that all the other project managers and program managers that I was working with were taking on. Um, so when I first came to the New York Times, I came from a mid-stage uh, tech startup, and so the first thing that hit me was the scale of the organization. I was working with like 30 or 40 technology teams as opposed to five, um, and everybody had their own ways of doing things. Something I really like about the tech org at the Times is that process is really bottom up. Teams can figure out the best ways to work for them. Um, but it makes it really complicated when you're coordinating a large initiative. There's lots of different teams involved. You have no clue how to get anything on anyone's roadmap. Um, and then even when you do, a lot of times things like that don't, don't necessarily come to fruition because teams aren't working in sync. So it's just sort of the challenges of working with an organization at scale. Um, so we had a lot of different like we had to communicate with stakeholders, we had to communicate with other product managers and project managers. We ended up with a lot of different tools that we needed to use to coordinate people across the whole organization. Um, and so while all of these tools were really important, they were really cumbersome to update. I spent my Fridays updating like a high level view for stakeholders, a more detailed view for my project teams on every project that I worked with, updating all of my milestones, updating my resourcing docs, and updating my roadmap. It was an actual nightmare. I spent like four hours doing this on a Friday morning. Um, it was like the least, uh, the least, the worst use of my time. Um, and it was really just a dumb experience. The user interfaces were difficult to use. They were all different. They all had different data types. I would update my pre-sourcing doc and it would propagate somewhere else. Um, I had already been playing around a little bit with Coda for my own personal use as well as for project planning more granularly with my teams. And I thought that it presented a really cool opportunity to sort of streamline some of this data into different places um, because we wanted to address a couple of different issues. Um, the process that you just saw was a huge bummer for a lot of different reasons. It was really time consuming, as I said, um, but more importantly, we didn't have a single source of truth about what was going on at the org. So we had a lot of situations where we had a team or a project that was being worked on by a data engineering team and an advertising technology team. And the data engineering team and the ad tech team called those projects slightly different things. And maybe one project manager thought the project was at risk, another project manager thought the project was on track. So you end up with two different status updates going out to two different groups of people talking about two different projects, except they're actually the same project. And we had this happen a lot. Um, it happened with status updates, it happened with dates. We had uh, updates going out with a date that didn't sync up with the roadmap tool that a different person was supposed to update. It was really just a little bit of a mess. Um, and then the tools that we did have, like our road mapping tool, they were too big and too much. Um, a product director would log into the system and see hundreds of items. All of our teams were reporting at different levels of granularity about the types of things that were going on. So you'd have roadmaps that were really nonsensical to people who weren't involved in the day-to-day -day work of what we were doing. Um, so we made a new thing. We made a coded document, um, or I made a coded document, um, and forced everyone else to use it. So it's pretty simple. This is like the bare bones. Very nicely, thanks, Elena. Um, this is the bare bones of sort of what we had, but basically it's a pretty simple model. We had one project for every row. A project couldn't exist in more than one place. Um, we captured some basic information about our projects, the name of the project, the status, um, some information about timelines, some information about the teams and the leads who were involved in these different initiatives. And at first it was really just an exercise in trying to get all of our projects into a one place and not have four different sources of truth for what was going on. But it became obvious very quickly that this helped reduce a lot of the busy work that folks were having to do. So as a project manager, I could go in and input the status of an initiative that I was working on, and it automatically propagated to all of the different types of views that different stakeholders would want to see. And so it immediately sort of got rid of the situation where like an advertising team was hearing one thing about a project and a marketing team was hearing a different thing about a project. Everyone had to have the same 
um, had, got the same information. And it also meant that multiple people working on the project were sort of forced to get together and agree on the status of a project, which sounds really simple, but it just wasn't happening. Um, the other really nice thing about this was that it got our team roadmaps in sync. So instead of every team having their own roadmap or their own um, version of what they were looking at doing that quarter, um, we have a single project and every team who's listed, who's involved is listed in the CODA document. And so if we're working on um, a dashboard or something like that, it shows up on every team's roadmap in the same time frame. So we no longer had a situation where maybe um, one team was ready to go on something that they had worked on another team to align on, and then it was it was time to go, and uh, one team wasn't wasn't ready to do it anymore. Um, so we had a lot of situations where timelines would shift, and this really forced them all to be in the same place, um, and for projects to show up on every team's roadmap at the same time, and it really forced some conversations to happen that hadn't been happening before. So this was really cool. Um, we iterated on it a little bit. And this is one of the things that I like most about Coda is I feel like it's a tool that can really grow with our processes. Um, I work with product development teams, and so we think a lot about how to build tools in their smallest possible version and then iterate and build new features as we go and as we learn about how the tools are used. So instead of having to think at the outset about what is every possible use case that we would need to solve for in picking a road mapping tool or picking a way to give our status updates, we just started with one thing. Let's get all of our projects in the same place. And actually, that solved a lot of problems that we didn't know it was going to. And so we didn't actually need a tool that could do uh, really complex road mapping. We just needed a way to um, understand what projects were going on when. So we, uh, we introduced some new features. We thought about, are there ways that we can visualize this and understand how our projects are linking up to our enterprise goals? What if we actually did prioritization directly in our CODA document? What if we gave stakeholders the ability to use these scales to indicate how important things were to them? Um, so this was a really interesting, um, this was, it was interesting for everyone, I think, because we were able to sort of introduce a new tool slowly and get folks on board and then introduce new features and actually bring the process of prioritization into CODA itself. So CODA sort of started as a representation of what was going on and then became the place where things were going on. That's how we did our work and not just a representation of the work we were doing. Um, I want to talk for a minute about how this sort of changed our process because I think it did a lot. Um, we, this roadmap that I showed you is for a really small corner of our organization um, and it has about 200 active projects and 50 complete projects over like a quarter. So we have a ton of data that's being stored here and it started as just this status update tool, and it now does prioritization. It helps us calculate how we're progressing against our OKRs and company goals. It's used for like every presentation that anyone does. Instead of um, you know a senior executive emailing everyone to ask what were the high priority projects this quarter, actually you just have all of that information, and it's a really simple query, and you can also visualize it and copy and paste it into a slide deck for your team. So that's kind of like cool. Um, I think it's been really process-like for us, which is really nice. So the big issue of all of our systems being really time-consuming. Um, I was able to drastically reduce the amount of work I had to do and that my coworkers had to do, and I didn't take away anything from anyone. All of our stakeholders still have access to the same types of views that they need, the roll-ups that they need, the way that they want to visualize information, uh, without shifting the burden of like updating all of those different tools to like product managers and project managers. We're spending a lot of time it's a single source of truth. We don't have issues anymore where there's um, where teams aren't synced up about what's going on. It's really obvious to everyone that CODA is the place that you go to find information. I kind of expected when we first started that it would be like a lot of project managers and product managers and folks who sort of fall into those disciplines looking at this document all the time. And I've been shocked to see that when I log into it, there's like never less than 30 people looking at it, people at all different levels of the organization. And so I love that it's a tool where um, anyone at any level of the organization feels comfortable going in and playing around and looking at what's going on and creating their own tools and visuals. Um, and then I think the other thing that's been really cool and that we've noticed is that uh, taking using CODA and shifting our prioritization process to live in that document has actually forced us to have some really intentional and interesting conversations about how we do prioritization. I don't know that we've had really um, intentional conversations about what are the values that we take into consideration when thinking about what projects to prioritize 
what are the criteria that we take more seriously at, a, at our company and thinking about how to impact revenue or impact engagement or impact user experience. And so it really forced us to sit down and have conversations across these like, you know, 40, 50 teams at the organization and sort of get everyone on the same page about like, hey, how do you prioritize? What's the information that you need to take into account? Um, and so that was a really cool, um, that was a really cool effect, an unanticipated effect, in that it um, sort of had us all um, had us all getting on the same page about things that we hadn't had conversations about. So I guess again, um, sort of uh, becoming the way that we work and not just the representation of our work. Um, so that's what we built. It's uh, been really successful. We're actually rolling it out to the entire organization right now. So rolling it out to all 50 of those teams as opposed to a small corner of it. And that's been a really interesting challenge to get all these different teams that work in different ways. Um, to be using the document and figuring out, you know, how do we change this so that it, it works for everybody. Um, but that's, I think, the best thing about it and the reason that uh, we've had so much buy-in from different folks at the organization is that folks feel um, that even if they don't see their exact use cases represented in the documents that we're creating or that we're trying to get everyone on board with, the flexibility of the tool means that, like, everybody can kind of get what they need out of it um, and that there's always the potential that the document might change or that we might iterate on it to, um, Taking new species in the future. So, that's my spiel. Are we doing questions or no? Yeah, so okay, cool. questions for Caroline? <laughs> yeah, in that process when you took it on, just in the organization, there a conversation about um, agile methodologies such as, such as Scrum, or is this leading you to that direction to like, think about Scrum and being agile? Um, so, uh, I would say about 50% of our teams are agile already today. Um, and if the other half of them are not, that's totally up to teams how they want to work. Um, but I feel that this, like these road mapping tools and our prioritization tools work pretty well for agile teams and like more traditional waterfall teams. Everybody has, so we actually have the ability for teams to indicate when things are happening based on specific dates or based on more vague categories like now, soon, future. And so that's one of the like sort of flexibility pieces that's really been helpful is allowing teams to collect information in different ways, but figuring out how to roll it up in a way that's sort of visible to everybody. Yeah. How do you control um, the viewing of the data? Like, how much do you curate control the views that you present to your board versus empowering people to do their own filtering of data? Yeah. That seems like a problem. It's it like, is a problem for me. Um, I, so when we first did it, I didn't put a lot of controls on it. I provided access. I sort of tried to replicate the views that people were used to to sort of manage some of the like anxiety around change. I had sort of gone rogue with this. I didn't like yeah, get anyone's permission. I was like, I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and so at first, I sort of let everyone create as many views as they wanted. I sort of was like, come to office hours. I'll teach you how to do it. You can learn. There's plenty of resources that are available. It became really, really, really cumbersome. Um, and as we're moving to this org wide doc where we have like nearly 600 people who would need to have access to it on a daily basis, like I realized like nobody can create anything. We're yeah. choosing the views. And so we handled it more um, actually with the design process. So we've gone in, we've done interviews with different teams, we've done usability sessions, trying to build a tool that will work for everyone. Um, we've really been playing a lot with the Coda API, which has been really helpful for us um, in saying that, you know, every team can build their own docs and their own views and information in any way you want create your own CODA document, and let me set up an API to sync your data to my master document so that you can have whatever views you want, and like I don't need your noise in my views. So using the API within CODA to? Yeah, to connect two different CODA okay, documents. So as opposed to an outside third party? We do actually use the CODA API to connect um, it to our Google Calendar. We have a shared Google Calendar that tracks all of our launches and stuff like that. So I sort of have a like push to calendar button in our document. Um, but yeah, we do also use it between CODA between Coda Docs, which has been really, really helpful in allowing teams to feel like they can get on board with the master document and also figure out how they want to do things their own way. And then they can make their own views. Yeah, they can make their own views. They can bring in other data. We have a lot of teams that are really interested in using it more to track OKRs or to understand like the team directories and stuff like that. And so if they want to have all of their own features, they can have that there. And as long as they have that data that I need for the master document, it's kosher. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, one one I had was when you said you had before coding different teams that like had their own description or name for the project, but the rest of the same project. Mm -hmm. How did you go about talking to all the teams saying, hey, like we're gonna unify on this like one naming convention and 
this tool? Mm -hmm. Like, how, how did that conversation go? Yeah, we weren't even like really unifying a naming convention. I just like if there was the same project, I wanted everyone to call it the same thing. And so it wasn't. I didn't get any pushback. Like I think everyone understood this as a pain point. We would often have situations where like two or like two product managers would get an email from a stakeholder saying. Hey, I saw that this um, Redbird email project is on track, but this like Redbird launch project is at risk. What's the difference? Well, is it on track? Is it at risk? It's creating extra work for stakeholders and creating a lot of noise for people who are sort of in the weeds. And so I think everybody sort of felt that pain point, and everyone was like, "That would be great if we had one way to name a project." Um, so yeah, I didn't get a lot of pushback about that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Caroline. Next up is uh, Chris, Chris Humberger. I'll let him introduce himself, but just one quick note about his presentation. When he sent me his slides, it was really exciting because I come from the world of uh, Microsoft Excel and Google Spreadsheets. And when he showed his screenshots of what he used to do on Google Sheets and Spreadsheets, I was like, oh my god, like, that was my life like a financial <laughs> analyst. And seeing him transform it into a code doc was like a really big win for me, just from my old days. But I'll let Chris take it over and let him explain. Thank you very much. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Sorry. No more two thrusts. <laughs> I'll take it all with me. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Chris. Uh, I am a product manager, and I also do the analytics at emissary.io. We are a, about 40 people. Uh, I'm going to very briefly tell you about uh, what we do, how we used to operate before Coda, and now how we operate with Coda. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I've got a bit of a demo too, so I think that's very exciting. Okay, Emissary and Coda. Um, our marketing team like puts a lot of work into slide decks, so I uh, figured I'd share some of their work with you. Um, so we are leaving sheets behind. Ha -ha. Um, thanks, Adam. Um, <laughs> So, we're, like I said, we're going to talk about uh, our background very quickly, um, previous <laughs> trackers, how we now use code, and what we're looking forward to in the future. So, Emissary, what is Emissary? We are, these are full marketing slides, so I, uh, I <laughs> apologize. <laughs> um, so, uh, ignoring all of this text, um, Emissary is about connecting people. We connect sales teams with advisors who used to work at the sales team's target. So they know the people that the sales team is selling to personally. They learn about their older coworkers, who likes whom, who has the budgets, uh, who's a rising star, that sort of thing. Um, so we are all about account strategy, account-based marketing, opportunity acceleration, up sales, expansion, renewals, land expense, spin sell, uh, bands, yeah, stuff like that. Um, it's uh, we have to connect our client management teams with our sales teams with our operations teams. Our operations team looking at individual uh, salespeople connecting to individual advisors, our uh, CX teams of course managing accounts, and our sales team of course selling. And everyone needs to know what's going on. But the thing is, we work in intangibles mostly. All the value we provide to our clients is very intangible. It's knowledge, right? It's locked away in your brain. So that's not very good when it comes to showing up for an ROI inspection, you might say. Uh, so it's a, a little difficult to say, well, you know, we accelerated this opportunity, but then someone might turn around and say, how much money did you bring? That's tough. So uh, briefly, Engagement Operations is the team I started on uh, and started. So they ensure, I have since moved off, you might have tell. Uh, they ensure smooth operation of scheduling, conflict bridge issues, you know, operation stuff. Uh, making sure also that we provide value to our users, which is actual intelligence, not just, oh, this is interesting, but what can I do with this little nugget of information to accelerate my own deal? How do I sell better because I know this? Um, correct decision makers, like, uh, am I even selling to the right person? You gotta make sure you're doing that if you wanna, like, sell. Uh, and relevant to making sure that the engagements that uh, are, that the conversations being had are relevant to sales cycle. Like, if you're, learning about the procurement process, but you haven't even talked to someone, it's not going to be that helpful, you know? Anyways, uh, and also, the big one, communicating value to the budget owners who don't actually use our product. Uh, so what did we need in a tracker? 
Oh boy. Uh, how many calls have occurred? You know, we want to be able to look at the transcripts and notes right on the dime. Uh, who's in the engagement? When does it start and end? Very basic information. What is happening next? What has the operations team done? Uh, because the operations team uh, works entirely separately from the CX team. Well, next to, but like independently, you know, not checking in every day for what to do next. Uh, the customer success team needs to go in sometimes and see like, what did we do in this situation? So that I can tell my client what's actually happening. Surprisingly difficult problem to solve. Uh, and the, the intangibles, of course. What did you learn? How did the deal progress? All of this stuff. Okay, so before Coda, what did it look like? This is going, this is going to be very Who's sad. The, uh... Uh, you know, these are really great stock photos. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that, I sometimes wish I worked with some of these people. <laughs> they look very friendly and lovely. Uh, they do, I mean, he's not like so, it's such bright teeth and stuff like that. <laughs> Someone gelled his hair for him. I wish we had that in the office. Anyways, uh, this was our transcript tracker. This was a spreadsheet to track every single call and the transcript from all of our engagements. You can imagine how quickly this went to uh, a bad place. Uh, and over on the right is call notes. That was we were about three paragraphs each in a single cell. Then we had a daily engagement report. This is a giant Google document that at the end of every day emailed itself to the customer success team. That's absurd. Um, this is one of five tabs on our communications tracker saying who reached out to call this person, when did we follow up, oops, and when did we actually have the call. This is actually not so absurd, but every one of these green cells is an index match lookup. You can imagine with thousands of engagements, building up in the backlog, maybe 200 active at a time, this grows very quickly and poorly. Plus, all of this information extends three more rows, uh, columns, wherever that is, to the right, and you're not looking at that ever. And that because you, and you need it there because this is all the background information for the engagement. It doesn't just matter when you have the call, but who the heck are you talking to? Um, and then down here you can see, like, here's an import. Here's a pivot table. This is a different tab of completed calls. Over there is a different pivot table. Trackers, CSVs, shoot me. Anyways, this is our <laughs> metrics tracker. Um, uh, no, please, I'm not even good. This is our second metrics tracker. These are different metrics that we're tracking on two different trackers. Um, this is our engagement status tracker. It's all the same information we just saw, but it's somewhere else. And it's different information that you're inputting. Um, you need like seven, this is, this is what I hate. Um, you need like seven different um, screens in order to look at a single engagement and get an idea of what's going on. And this is a different one. Anyways, too many trackers, too many trackers. They don't talk to each other. Those are all SQL exports that at the time were not securely exported from our database. Uh, there's no one way to look at engagement and see how well it's doing. Is this going well? is a basic question about an engagement that we have no idea to how to answer, even how to begin answering. Like, yeah, they had five calls. Who cares, you know? You could get on a call and talk about the weather for an hour. I have seen that happen, it's not good. Uh, all of it is read-only data because it's index match. It's all a formula. If someone deletes the wrong thing, that's really unfortunate, and you have to go and rebuild that. Plus, if, you know, they delete the wrong thing, it's gone. Um, it was very slow loading, you know, that gray bar in the top right corner is bad. Uh, no one actually really remembered them. You had to have a whole bookmarks folder, and they don't move quickly. Okay. I got my blood pressure going a little bit, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so our code of tools. Uh, this is a demo document. And uh, oh, just I'll escape to yeah, thank you. Uh, this is already loaded. Here we go. Engagement tracker. Okay, it's a little name. Uh, all right, so we're going to skip past the readme because I'm going to read it to you. This is a overview of every project in a demo, uh, every engagement that is happening. So we can see at a glance if you like, you know, if you like cards. Look, these are all green. We've got three green. That's good. Three yellow. No, not so great. One red could be three. Not that. Anyways, uh, but we're going to go to the really the good view. It is here. Uh, this is what would be. Each engagement operations person, each operator had a personal view that they could look at all the projects they own here, down here, um, and a to-do list. So not only do we keep our own team organized, we also keep everyone on sync and knowing what is each person working on today. 
at night. You know, if I'm a manager, I can go in and say, what is Chris working on today? Oh, Chris is not good at distributing feedback, for instance, but uh, Chris is like planning ahead to draft some copy. Okay, great, but I really need Chris to distribute that feedback now. You can go uh, work with people. And this was, um, this was actually built before some of the uh, new Axe integration scheme. So there's, I mean, you can put Slack messages in here, you can put, uh, you, know, you name it, right? And then down here we have a list of each of the projects. Uh, my projects in this case are not doing great. I have one green and two not great projects, but this was an innovative invention for us, was the drop down menu, <laughs> red, yellow, and green. Because now we have a single place to say this is good or this is not good. And that's something that's missing in Google Sheets. I mean, yeah, you can put it in, but it's not just easy to see and pick it up, right? Um, and then what I really love about this is that these are all items. What we have here is uh, we have an object-oriented database in the back end. So if you want to comment on this and say, like, mm, Cooper, really great job. Al, oh, thanks for commenting on this. I can't click today. But yeah, see, and then you just comment on it. It's like, great job. And now Cooper logs in. It's like, hey, I did a great job on this. That's really nice. And it's there. I mean, you know, commenting on an object feels like a very simple thing to have in an application-based world, but how would you do this in Google Sheets without like spreading comments and absolute noise everywhere? Uh, plus, they link all to clients. All of these clients are objects. You could have fields here. You could have contact fields. You could have, you know, everything. Um, and buttons. You need to add an action item right here. Chris needs to... Uh, Tonight, Chris needs to have a beer. And bam, right here. Displays, adds quickly. It's not done yet. It's not done yet. I haven't had my beer. But, well, I actually forgot to assign that to myself. But if you don't want to use the button, you can add one here. Fills in with all the relevant information. You know, and you can um, check it off. It disappears nicely. Color coding. It's very, it's clean. It's quick. It's, it's like pleasing to look at. You know, it's a place where you want to go to do your work. I'm starting to sound like a uh, salesperson. <laughs> uh, plus, you, I mean, anyone can organize their view as they want, things like that. Um, and it works very, uh, very simply, right? If you need just the high level overview, okay, this client is doing all right. But if we wanted to go over to like Lindsay's listening service, Lindsay has only one project and it's going really well. And it's really important that this one project goes well because it's maybe a pilot program. Or something, you know? And so the flexibility and the speed at which we were able to build all of this, this bulleted list of items is just a lookup and then sort and then bulleted list. And like dot notation was something that blew my mind as like a spreadsheet thing. Because coming in, like thinking backwards and recursively from Google Sheets, as you, you might do, was not intuitive to me at all. But working left to right is very intuitive. All right, um, that is the blitz of the demo. I'm going to just say, high level, the benefits that we got from this. We had a unified place for operational data. With you know four projects in a demo document, it doesn't look super flashy. But we have, for each person, we have now six people on our team. Each person is managing 50 separate engagements, has a to-do list probably 40 or 50 long, which is not you know, a difficult to-do list to is set up this call, you know, follow up on this email, do this, but if you don't organize that, you're gonna run out of time and run out of headspace very quickly. Um, Object-oriented, flexible database was something as the person maintaining and building it and fixing it was very, very nice and very easy to show people, like, it's how it works. Uh, you, it's very easy for us to set something up for our non-technical users. Our customer success and sales team has views in just to select clients, look through transcripts, add documents, very easy for them, uh, even if they're not uh, technically minded. And it handles lots of data quickly, like I said, thousands of lines we have processing in ours. Um, and I mean, just for me to step back and think about the number of index matches that I've saved myself from typing is honestly a huge thing. And it updates throughout the entire document, which is nice, it all communicates with itself. Uh, and really what we're excited for is automations and integration. So we've got uh, packs coming in, we're gonna have like, Email alerts when something goes wrong. Uh, auto create actions when you create a new engagement so we can have a standardized set of like the first run. Uh, buttons, I love buttons, you know, they're so fun. Um, 
They, they are. Okay. Uh, uh, what else? Oh yeah, we're going to split out our document so that we don't have everyone in the same place. We can have uh, the same data in two separate documents and it's going to connect very easily, which is really nice. And customized layouts of individual parts. So I can have a bunch of backend calculating fields that I don't have to show to anyone. I don't have to worry about people deleting them or changing them or any way. It's just, it's tucked away behind the interface for me to look at. And I, I really like that. All right, that's it. Any questions, I guess?
but not least, you've probably seen one of their videos. Here's uh, Jen from Twitter. Here we go. So, wait, so how do I get to my, um... Oh, so you're just going to hit escape and then, like, use the tab. Perfect. Okay. I guess you should tell people where the outfits are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to, but I kind of am wearing the outfit. <laughs> right? Like, these are the pants and shoes I had in mind when I asked who was making the avatar. Anyway, no strikes, obviously. So, all right. So I actually, I made my presentation in... Codadoc because that's actually you can you can create presentations in Coda. Don't take my design though as what <laughs> it's capable of. So anyway, I just tried to keep it really basic. So I'll start from the beginning. I started at Cheddar back in March. If you don't know um, who Cheddar is, we're a broadcast news organization. Um, we have two networks, so we're creating 16 hours of live broadcast a day. Um, and uh, we're 180 people. So when, so I started on the business operations team. And the business operations team at Cheddar, so we are essentially a neutral party within the organization. We're really here. We're there to work across all of the teams and to ensure that everyone's working towards like the North Star of our company. So of all of the goals that we have put into place are all of the teams working towards those goals and prioritizing appropriately. Um, and so essentially, we are also asking on a day-to-day, -day, are we operating efficiently? Are our teams communicating well? How can we simplify our workflows? What tools should we use? And then the bigger question is too, how can we like minimize the amount of tools that we're using on a day-to-day? So that's, that's like the biggest complaint that you get from being a business operations team. Like, I have to go from here and then here and then here. And especially in a media organization, producers, uh, they're not like really wanting to follow a really strict, crazy process. Like their day to day is just get shit done. And um, even tracking stuff, like where do I have to put this? Like outside, I use ENPS, that's it, which is like this very intense uh, tool that they do use. But anything outside of that, like really. So minimizing the amount of tools. So. When I started at Cheddar, so this is my boss, Peyton, uh, she it was like my first week, she's like, yeah, we're trying out this new beta tool, it's called Coda, it's really, really cool, I don't know, you need to check it out, it has like all the tools within all the tools, like within one tool. And so for me, I was just like, wow, that's, that's really, that's great, I'm going to look into this. And so I was basically the lead on our team to kind of investigate Coda, check out what it's all about. And so... You know, just starting off really simple, like obviously G Suite is a very common thread in all the presentations, and I'm sure you guys can relate to it as well. We're very, very dependent on G Suite at our company. And so very similar to what Chris was saying, you know, naturally what just begins to happen, you get layers and layers of Google Docs, layers and layers of Google Sheets. So this particular example of my own personal workflow is when I'm managing a business initiative. So you know, one, I would have a Google Doc for, okay, here's the project goals and problems to solve. Okay, here's another doc for notes. Um, here's another doc for other notes because I really just want my notes to be separate from those notes. And then here's a random doc that someone else created and then you just hear about like in the ether, oh crap, okay, let me like add that to the Google folder so it's all organized in one place. And then the same thing, you know, you need to have spreadsheets for a certain reason because you need to outline budgets, timelines, um, anything that you just want to organize within a table, um, and then again, you get a bunch of other random sheets that people create. So what I did first and foremost with Coda was consolidating all of these seven touch points into, into one place, or Coda allowed me to do so. Um, so this is my template. I'm, I'm going to show you two Codas that I built, and this is kind of like my more like simple, straightforward one. So this is my uh, project management template that I use when I'm leading a business so, you know, everything on the side right around here is like what a Google Doc, like what traces a Google Doc with each section. And then if I'd like, you know, I can compartmentalize them within folders. So if you're an organization freak like me, so. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so project summary, you know, using the table just to clearly organize my information. Um, you know, I then have another table to pull in all of the folks that are working on this project. 
Um, and whoever I assign to or share this Coda doc with, the um, tables, if I set it to, um, should be set to people. And whoever I start typing, you know, it'll pull the person in right there and have their avatar, which is, you know, just a nice little app addition, visual addition. Um, I can build my timelines within here. So what I do is I have, like, my base milestones, so, like, all of my high-level things. So, like, kickoff, phase one, okay, we're testing, now phase two. And what's awesome is, like, so I have this same table and a different view. I then just have this being my detailed um, my detailed action plan. So essentially, this one is filtered to only show anything that's a milestone. And then my action plan, this is like everything. So I'm not working off of like two different tables of data. And you know like if you update in one place, it's all synced together, which is amazing. Um, if I'm working on a process, um, Building out a process, you know, I don't know if anyone has done a racy before, one of the races. Um, you know, I just, <laughs> there is so much fun. Um, but, you know, I, I just do it right within here. Um, so, you know, it's obviously just has the capability of a spreadsheet that I throw into a photo doc, and then everything is just organized in this one location, um, and it's the go-to for um, everyone working on the project. And we actually, we have a very similar, um, Project initiatives, Loda, that um, Caroline, Caroline I, like, had a mental note to like, remember it. <laughs> and then very similar, and then we put all of our sub project docs within that greater um, prioritization project table, which is massive and is very like crazy as yours. It's just like hundreds of projects in there. But it's cool because it all comes together. Um, Oh, and then my other thing, right, so then my meeting notes where I was talking about, obviously, like, I really like having my meeting notes very, very specific and clear and not layering on top of each other, so very straightforward. So, that's my first stop. Um, you know, and so as I got more comfortable with Coda, again, like, the thing is, it's like, take it slow, I would say, is my recommendation. Just don't overwhelm yourself with all of the features at first. It's just... Starting with like, okay, what's the main thing I need to solve for? And then building layers on there, which Caroline Chris with one of you have said that as well too. Completely agree. So um, but what when I became really comfortable with Coda, what's cool about it is you know what Evan was saying, it's really a tool that allows me to build many apps, which is hot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what does this mean? One word Legos. So I like, thought that was such an original idea, and then I was looking at your branding, like, no, it's Legos in the branding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not original. <laughs> and like, the funny thing is, I was talking to my friend last time, like, oh, I'm doing this presentation, and he's like, well, what's Coda? And I was trying to explain it to him, and he's a creative director, he's like, metaphors. Everyone loves metaphors. So then this morning, I'm like, I have a metaphor, Legos. I meant, <laughs> but it's in my subconscious. So Lego. Anyway, so I'll give you my metaphor. So um, I get my nephew Legos every year for Christmas or his birthday. He loves them. And, you know, I obviously don't make the Legos. They're manufactured somewhere in a factory. You know, obviously the Legos, um, I can get him a Minecraft game one, and obviously it gives him the tools and the instructions to build whatever he wants to build. And he has like this really cool thing. So, but then he obviously always mixes all of the pieces. And then, you know, I always encourage him, like, it's all is not lost. You know, you can, you can build what you want with those building blocks, something custom, something very, very unique. Um, so like, what's your end goal? Like, what do you want to create, Colin? And so um, it's like kind of the same way with codas, that like you, there are a lot of templates available and you can build something very straightforward and simple there but really once you learn all of the features and the nuances of it you can get like really creative and just start layering in like exactly all of the constraints and things that you want for your final workflow so you can get it's just like a very creative tool um so Um, the next coda that I created or the next doc that I created so came out of a business problem where our producers um, and our copy, copy um, managing 
copy editor, they basically just, so there's like 20 producers who are writing articles every single day. And so for our videos, they don't always get an article. So there's a step that happens where they, the team needs to prioritize all of the um, videos that they're going to write articles for and then publish it on Shutter.com. So, and also there's a lot of different checkpoints in this process. There's a lot of different people who just, you know, randomly need to come in and oversee something. Um, and also, it was all happening just like through the ether, like through Slack, through email, like basically at any the choosing as being how I interpreted it when they were explaining it to me. So, um, you know, really it's like eight core steps that really happen. So producers assigned, they write the article, they edit it, there's comments on it, comments are addressed, final, and then put it into our CMS, right? Um, so what I did, what Voodoo has allowed us to do is just really streamline this process and create like transparency of the, of the workflow itself. So I'll just jump into it to kind of bring it to life a little bit more. So again, like they, they our producers, like they don't really track things. <laughs> so um, this basically became the place where whoever was deciding what uh, our videos we wanted to prioritize for the day to create an article, this is where it then is dumped in the beginning of each day. From there, the executive producers are then able to assign their writer, or the producer, same thing in our company because we're so small and scrappy, um, the, to, write, to write it. Um, and so this just right off the bat just gives us full transparency of the, of the process. And then we assign it a status. So um, then once a producer is assigned to it, they are able to have go in and write write their article. So this is the same table. This is just the layout view that everyone was walking through. So um, they can go in here, write their article, and then they change it. So just imagine this was out assigned. They changed it to written. And then we have an automation set up where when it moves to written, it then alerts our managing copy our copy editor to then go in look at all of the, um, the article, add comments, and then she changes it to, you know, the comments are in there, that alerts the producer. So it creates this really nice back and forth workflow with like getting rid of Slack, getting rid of email, and it's just, you know, transparency, triggers, it's all, it's all just kind of tucked into this doc here, which is really, really nice. And then again, like the views, it's all the same data that you know everyone can have their own view and um, know what they have to. We have like filters set up so it's um, only showing in view what that person is responsible for. So that's the other thing too. It's like we don't want to overwhelm the producers with too much information. Let's isolate exactly what they need to see and know, which is great. Um, yeah, so that, that's the basic gist of the stuff. And then, um, yeah, just my final thoughts. Uh, so essentially, the great thing about Coda is that whenever we have a business problem, it's really like the first place that we go to to kind of be like, can we build it in Coda? Do we have to introduce another tool? Um, yeah. Any questions? Any questions for Jen? I'm just curious. Um, so prior to Coda, you were talking about people were putting stuff in email and Slack, and the problem that everyone had right? multi channel. Yeah. Firestorm of, of, of tasks and stuff. So, what wasn't like? So, for example, with Google Sheets, it wasn't happening, but with Coda, you got it to happen. So, how did you get people to abandon slacking and emailing things and actually all go? Like, what was the funnel, or how did you convince people? Yeah, that's cultural. I guess uh, culturally, how did you want to? Yeah, I think with any new process, right, it is definitely reinforcement. I think. Um, you know, but for me, because whenever I kick off a project, I then made that I added everyone, sent an email like, this is where everything is happening, this is where we're operating out of. Um, I'm not gonna lie, there still are some like straight Google Sheets and Docs that occur, and people are like very adamant about working in it. So, you know, which I, I'm kind of under the mindset that if you get people to do something like 85% of the time, that's a win. So you're always gonna have the outliers. But, it, it, you know, for the most part, like everyone, they know, and I think you know it's also a training for people to, that it's not so scary. We, we personally need to do more of that in our company. It is a bit isolated on the biz ops team being the experts. So I think that would help too, getting everyone very comfortable showing that it's not scary. And then people would create more things in there. Uh, 
it's interesting that you said that. What doesn't talk to the CMS, it's actually like a band-aid for our CMS right now because we don't have really great um, drafting capabilities or workflow. Like it's really hard to filter the data to know like at what stage that it's in. So essentially this is what was created until our engineering team like builds it out to be a bit more robust and accommodate. Um, yeah. Because that's kind of like an idea that Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jen. All right, so I guess we'll just kind of open it up for any last minute questions for any of the speakers. Um, it is 7.40, and we should be coming in five minutes, so if you just hold tight, we'll, we'll, we'll be here, I promise. I hope. Um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so I have this is a general question about Coda users. And so the current problem we're running into that we haven't figured out how to solve, maybe the Coda folks can solve it, is we're trying to find a way that when you make an update to a page, people know about it. This is, we haven't, we can't figure it out. We even wrote Coda and they sent this like convoluted solution that we haven't figured out yet. So, any does anyone have this this particular problem where your you know I I own a bunch of pages pages docs what do you what's the term there's sections yeah section okay so I own a bunch of thank you I own a bunch of sections someone else owns a bunch of sections and when I make an update to one I want people to know about it and I haven't figured out how to do that so it's really frustrating is that I have to slap it it just seems like it's so weird. anyone have it? Solve that, or well, maybe I'm doing it wrong. Are you like writing in the canvas or in a table? Like, or is it like this where your text is both, just right? Both, both. Like, so if I make an update to a table, mm -hmm. or I make an update to a canvas, either yeah. one. So we have a similar issue with our projects where people are really used to the functionality in our folks use like Jira that the ability of being able to like watch an issue, and that was like one of the biggest sticky points for me in trying to get people to use it. So we actually built watching functionality in Coda, so the ability to sort of like assign or unassign yourself as a watcher to a specific project. And so we don't have, a, we, didn't, we don't do notifications, but we do have sort of a hub for people, and we have at the beginning a way for people to see, like, the project I've watched, have they been updated since the last time I was here? Um, and that's worked really well for us. So it's not necessarily a push, but it is a way for people to digest change, changes that have happened in the past week or so, every time they log in. Um, I don't know what to do if you are using packs, you can just yeah. put a bus in that connects to Slack. And every time you make an update, push the button, it'll send a Slack message, a uh, message for you. So put a button at the top of the page, it says, it's updated. And then it'll send a message for you that says, yeah. it's been updated, what can I do? OK. There are, a few, there are a few different notification patterns in the products. Yeah. Uh, many of them are, are oriented around tables. So like by default, yeah, for example, when you assign a person, that will notify that person. Yeah. And if you configure a button, there's also a notify command. Oh, yeah. That's just germane to the product, so it'll send in a COVID email uh, if you just hit it as notify. But you can also use any of the packs to do like, a custom message that says, hey, I just updated this section. Here's a link to it. And, it's, and if it's some if it's some area on that section, I just need to highlight and comment on it. Yeah, actually, you can just use the commenting feature in that case. And at reference the person. Yeah. Like, that's actually prompt. But that's basic <laughs> right. It's just using commenting to yeah, it's reference the yeah. person. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Actually, like a little Easter egg is um, the way we actually do support with uh, all our users is we tell them just add mention one of us, like Al, Evan, or anyone on our team. And then we normally just jump into your doc and like start working with you on the doc. Um, so I, I get pings all the time saying, like, oh, like so and so has mentioned you in his doc. Can you help me with this like structuring this table or whatever? Um, so actually, a little secret is we just add a bunch of one of us. If you need help, it is, um, but not for like notifying other people. Like if you help with something. That's how we yeah, when we when we wrote where we wrote for this problem, they sent back a link, and then we didn't have access to it. But then we got access to it. Like, so something was built for us. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I guess the same question applies, but based on the user, but how many are um, actually using this as sort of the back end uh, to uh, deliver a service for a user and be able to sort of charge or have a business model behind it? Like, if you were to say, you probably don't have this information, I don't know, but like, how many of all your users are actually? Yeah, I mean, I'd say now it's so much concerned with this as well. It runs, I mean, our use cases run the gamut, like on the large enterprise side or bigger customers, people who are like supplementing existing process and solving very hyper specific problems. I read cases that I mentioned earlier where they're like, they're literally building out these task lists and color coding cells for Gantt charts. I'm like, why, why are we doing this? <laughs> um, for small businesses, they'll often build like their version of the CRM that they actually want or something like into that without having. I so build for supply decision, then you kind of extend that out and actually use for the full functionality. And we do have a set of users actually on our community. Um, if you haven't looked at it yet, community of code at IO. There's a lot of people who are talking about documents that they're just building for the community to start using. And so the idea that we have is that over time, this gallery that we have, uh, some folks will just kind of share use cases through it, but other folks will share actual uh, models that they want to bring to the world and actually one of those. We're at a point still where we're in beta, and so it's a, it's a free product. We really want to make sure we're solving problems for people, but um, it's up with the future that we do. Which are to use in the product? Uh, I was wondering if there's offline functionality at this time. Because in the case I would be to use it, we need an internet connectors. Yeah, uh, yeah, so the short answer is yes. Um, that is a key question. The, yeah, so uh, is there offline access? Or products. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you have it open in your browser session and you go offline, you can still access and manage the uh -huh. contents of the doc. And then once you regain access to Wi-Fi, it'll sync those changes back up. Okay. You'll actually get a little message on the top of the screen that tells you when you're offline. Mm -hmm. I know for me, in this, in this building, I'm a guest at work, and sometimes I have this internet connectivity, so I'm saying this like, hey, just make sure you stay in the browser until we get back on to work. <laughs> yeah. So it, it does work. I guess, uh, sure. Yeah. So, like, actually, if you go to community.coder.io, we kind of soft launch this feature, but basically, you can now embed a doc into any website um, for anyone to see. Um, so, obviously, you don't want any like, really private sensitive information in there, but now you can actually put your doc, your doc and show it to the world, and anyone can play with it, push the buttons, move, move data around, all that kind of stuff, filter it. Um, before that, you really like know the individual user you want to share that doc with, and you had to know whether or not they're going to edit access or view access. Um, we kind of soft launch it in the community, so it's something you can check out. Check out if you find something. How do you determine is it by a section or is it by a table, or how do you how do you parcel out what data from which section is going? Yeah, so right now it's like everything. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we'll so it's, it's, at the it's at the doc level. At, at the doc level, yeah. So they will they'll see the entire um, section. We've certainly heard the request for section level commissioning. It's something we, yeah. we have a lot of ideas around, but at the moment, um, we're kind of trying to get those, those experiences. You can, pull, you can pull information from one document to the other, into another. Currently, right. using the API, you can do that. Oh, using the API. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. That's what you are doing. Yeah, yeah. You guys have yeah. 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 Carol, how did you actually do the doc to doc like, talking materials? Um, I mean, I don't like code, so that really helps. <laughs> um, but I actually work with a lot of folks who have built API integrations. Like, you guys have some decent documentation about how to do it, like some code you can copy and paste and play around with. What, what, was that the question? How do you how do, they do it? Well, how did you, uh, what, what were the tools or libraries you used to connect the two docs together? Oh, cool. So, actually, you like use some of your null sample script and, and change it a little bit. So, there's like you guys have like an API documentation somewhere in your learn system, and there's like a couple of examples. And one of them actually is doing a one way sync. Uh, but usually, I was just sort of looking at the code API documentation, looking at the API documentation for whatever system I wanted to connect to. Um, yeah, and I, I, I built most of my stuff in like a Google Scripts 
while like this automated it. Um, I think now that we're working at like an enterprise wide level, we're trying to make those systems a little bit more robust. So I'm actually like working with an engineer to do some of that for us. Um, but I actually found it, as much as I coded in a long time, I found it very simple to, to play, at least with the code API. The Google Suite APIs were a little bit more cumbersome, but yeah. So where's the code base lib? So if you're connecting two separate code dots, where are you, where's the, where are you actually writing the code? Where's the, I'm, the... I'm, I'm automating a Google script, okay. like a Google, like a Google script project. Okay, so yeah. connecting the URL to the... <laughs> um, it's a little bit more complex than that. There is really good documentation on it, but essentially, like, you're looking for document IDs and table IDs. So the way that I have it set up is I sort of say, like, here's my source table and my source, my source doc, here's my target table and my target doc, and then I'm working with the people who maintain their documents to get our call, like, get all of our documents and our tables in, in sync. So I'm saying, here's the data I need. Can you make sure that you have that accessible in a way that I can find in your document? And then we just set up a twice daily sync. So basically anything that's written in these like sort of child documents gets pushed up to the parent document. Um, it works really well for keeping, for my use case, which is like keeping projects listed. So when someone in our growth team adds a new project, I just wanted to add to our master growth app. There's some limitations. It's difficult. You can sort of like create an update, but you can't delete. So I think it sort of depends on your use cases. But yeah, I found it simple to use with the Google script. It's worth saying that. This is, it's a request that comes up fairly often, which is linking the documents together. And we've got a bunch of uh, prototypes that we've built internally over the last six months to kind of solve this problem. Um, but right now, we've seen like the API usage has actually helped yeah. a lot of the basic. It's worked really well for me together. before you guys had like a Google Calendar API, yeah. we did the same thing. And it, it, yeah, I found it very easy to, to do. Um, and even if you like don't know how I code, like working with people who are like, okay, like yeah, this, this variable is obviously this thing. Like it's not. It's, it was very complex, I should say. Yeah, I yeah. yeah, exactly. You can stumble your way through it. Exactly. Yeah. 